Okay, I'm okay, I'm putting this thing up. Oh, I don't know why I'm putting my headphones on. I, I keep thinking this is a screencast because it was a screencast I have to put the um, have to put the mic on. But um, anyhow, every now and then I come up with ideas for um, for VR and stuff. Uh, this is a precaution. It's not really an idea, but it's a precaution. Um, if you've ever used a VR headset inside of a car, you'll notice that the VR headset has its own compass. Now, if that if you're driving in the car, of course, uh, as the car turns, so will all of your world within the VR space. So the, the way to counteract this is that all of the car manufacturers, or you don't really even need that, all you need is you need a counter compass, so you need another VR um, device that attaches to the car that has its own compass and then it will um, communicate its rotation and then you need the, the VR headset to counter rotate to that. So to, it'll look at the difference between the two, um, the, it'll be able to determine where, what is moving the vehicle that you're in is moving and w with relation to that how your head is moving so that you won't get that effect so they will have to release um, a VR device and I haven't gone around to look around for this but I just thought to myself you know that's something they need they don't necessarily need it within the car but maybe a Bluetooth device or something that it can connect to and communicate the the rotation information the um, because these things use compasses to determine where you're orienting your head and I went on vacation and some people my, my parents were driving the car and I was in the car and, and as they were turning the vehicle I was getting dizzy because I could never keep everything together I was actually in alt space VR and I was connected via a cell phone using it as a hotspot. And as the car was turning, I was having to counter turn myself in the world because it uses a compass. So that's that was one major concern back then. Um, and it, but such things are gonna be needed um, in the future if you use AR glasses with cars because one of the, one of the big benefits to augmented reality is uh, doing GPS within the headset with the with the special AR glasses that you will actually be able to see on the horizon all the, the destination places. Um, there's a big concern with monuments. There are people that are holding on to slave trade monuments and the black community wants to get rid of them and the and the, you know the the people who are sons of Confederate soldiers and whatnot and uh, there was a a group of people that were called the Daughters of the Confederacy that had created all these monuments to the Confederacy and what they were really trying to do was trying to um, trying to show uh, they were trying to downplay the slavery um, the slave trade they were they were actually and they were actually rewriting it in such a way to make it seem like the slaves were okay to be slaves just silly stuff, you know, and there are certain monuments out there that just remind people that slavery existed in the past. Um, and there are some black people that just don't want those, those uh, monuments, I get probably a good number of them. And so there's no reason to keep the monuments around, but you got people that want the monuments, because they want that part of history. Well, the solution to that problem is, is to mark in GPS locations where the monument was, have somebody create the 3D object that is that monument, tear down the monuments, tear down all the all the slave um, trade buildings and stuff, um, and, or reinstitute them for some other purpose because monuments restrict your freedoms on to where to put places, you know, where you need to, um, I mean, if some, if, you know, if a monument is getting in the way of a of a new um, plan for a town, the town maybe you move the town, or you just get rid of the monument, or you move the monument, or um, 
you could keep the information in GPS location in coordinates and um, and put it in a 3D space and load up an app on your device and actually see where all the monuments are especially with augmented reality glasses people who are wanting to recreate um, any kind of, of incident that happened anywhere even you know in the recent past they can keep all that information in GPS coordinates and as you're going down and looking through an augmented, re augmented reality headset or even you can do this with iPads I'm sure now um, with GPS locations you could actually just hold up your iPad and see all of the monuments but they would be able to do that with augmented reality glasses you could see where all the places you want to go all the monuments and so then there's no real reason to hang on to the monuments uh, when you could have it in a virtual space now some people would say well that's not the same thing you don't to deceive but you could take VR 180 videos of all the insides of those buildings you know to a great resolution and it would be just like you were there and then the big advantage to this is that anybody in the world can come and visit those monuments. However, you won't be able to have like a, uh, you won't have a um, gift shop, but with this coronavirus and things like that, um, it opens people up to other possibilities. Like um, people are always intent on people coming to church um, there are businesses that thrive on when people are let out of church they go and they eat at certain places if they don't aren't allowed to go to church then they're not supporting those businesses however um, what good can can come out of the coronavirus is is that you um, have people who are in hospitals people who are for whatever reasons not able to come to church they can experience that um, and um, with things like Zoom, although we need to get something that's not Zoom because Zoom is based in China, um, to have those services available in the U.S. Um, in such a way that people can interact inside of a church. Um, if they go to class, they can in interact in a class. Um, you know, if people tend to go back to church, they can still go to church from their from their um, a hospital bed and interact with people that are in the in the uh, discussion and so and I was thinking to myself other things like um, people who are um, how they're talking about people going to school now they're claiming um, that in some schools they're requiring the kids to wear gloves to wear face masks and that they can only eat and um, and learn in the same room that people are not going to go around in hallways I can understand the thinking behind that it makes perfect sense because the coronavirus is going to spread as long as you're coming in contact with strangers so if you're in a big school with 300 people um, the likelihood that uh, once somebody gets sick they're going to spread it to everybody that's in the school if they're traveling down the hallways or if they're passing by them but if you're only going to one room, only the people in the room will get sick and you'll know that it's related to somebody that was in that room rather than you would be able to pinpoint who got sick or that you'd be able to test those people in that room. And it, for the purposes of coronavirus, it makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, but what other people are going to find out is that they can homeschool and they could just avoid going to the school at all and homeschool and for that reason um, there should be tax credits specific to the communities um, in such a way as to reimburse the tax that would be taken out for them to um, to support a local school a public school um, if they so decide that the public school isn't teaching the kinds of things they want to teach their children then um, they I, I don't know if this is the case or but there should be things in our in the in tax law that um, um, permit people to to opt out of um, taxes that would go to a public school 
and then they wouldn't be so up in arms about what goes in the public school. They'd have the option of going and doing um, and doing homeschooling and then getting the tax credit so they don't have to support the local public school. Um, and and if they don't like this coronavirus and the way they the the children are are treated there, then they could choose to have their schooling at home. Um, and or even at you know of course you can go to private schools or you can choose other methods you could have schools online and you know uh, or there's even a potential for people that use VR headsets to have VR schools have school in VR um, and so I'm wondering if people are thinking with VR headsets the potential of, of sending uh, students to schools in VR because then then they don't really have to go to school they don't you don't have to homeschool and there would still be a way for the states to to track their um their progression in the schools they would and you could actually probably get a more international type of teaching so that you could get you could choose to whether to have schooling according to your state, schooling according to your country and state, school according to your country, state, and the world, and, you know, have options like learning multiple languages, um, learning about laws in other countries if they see the future, they're going to be a missionary or they're going to be doing something in another country. Um, they should have those options available. They probably have things like that, but probably not in any organized way and people could be paying um, like subscriptions to such schooling things okay other ideas um, sports sporting events people are worried about sporting events um, out of the coronavirus what the VR community could bring to the table is the ability for people to attend games um, through VR um, cameras this would reduce the density of the people in the stadium, which is going to be reduced because there will be a scare of coronavirus. So people and the other thing is they have to keep their spacing, their distance. You're not going to be able to have um, for a while. You're not. People see this as temporary, but there's a pot potential that there could be more in the future. And so if there is more in the future, the people are going to want to get VR headsets. Uh, sports can still continue with um with these kinds of threats and how you do it is you um you put vr cameras all along the sports stadium you have the the people f uh, playing the game you still have the people and the fans in the stadium but now uh, even if you had the entire stadium full you could make more money by permitting people to be in the stadium who can't be in the stadium by permitting them to have VR access um, to the to being at uh, the 50 yard line, and you could have a potential of of bringing millions of people into the stadium, not just having them on TV, watching them from TV. You could give them the option of paying five, ten dollars a ticket to to go and sit at the 50 yard line and watch it from the sidelines, watch it from over hand, o overhead um, overhead drones. You could have it from, from dolly cam. You could have it from, um, from the helmets themselves. Have VR cameras inside the helmets so you could see from the point of view of the person. Um, of course, it would have to be gyroscoped, steadied because it'd be crazy um, to it would be very disorienting for people to be using VR headsets and and watching some player just shaking all over the place because they think they're shaking all over the place. So that would have to there would have to be something fixed there. But there's great potential there for making money if you want to make money off of things like that. There's a great potential for that as one way to make money off of VR is is um is to offer people um, access to the games. I mean, you can do it through television, but it's um, it's not the same thing as being there. Um, but, you know, they could probably say, well, then no, not many people are going to want to be at the game. There's a different, there are people that prefer to be at the game. There are people that would not 
who have problems with being around other people and especially with COVID there are people that are probably never going to come back to actually going to the to the games in the stadiums and there are people that um, argue why should our government be paying for a stadium why should we be paying taxes to a stadium why shouldn't the stadium actually be and they see the thing is is that you could you could through using VR and the internet and things like that you could actually pay for the stadiums through um, through um, that sort of thing it would be extra revenue but you could also get over that hunch uh, the hump of trying to get people to buy into the stadium who are in the city who don't want to pay the taxes to put a stadium in you know they're um, so there's a there's a lot of potential for VR there there's things that would fix things that um, it could threaten but that's every change that's the reason why there are conservative capitalists is because they're afraid of change change means they lose money in some unforeseen way they like predictability that's the reason why people that's what makes people conservatives is they like predictability they like to hold on to what they 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 don't like it when things change you know because it's disorienting um, liberals tend to think of the future things that could change things that need to change because um, because if those things change then people see the the world in a different way and conservatives don't want that because um, they're the kind of people that they're just they prefer to live the way that they they've lived before they like predictability that's the reason why people go to McDonald's is so that they can eat uh, a, they know what to expect when they go to a McDonald's and um, so the thing is is that and when this virus occurred and everybody was completely disoriented the thing is is that they kept you know jumping on the liberals you know what if it ain't broke don't fix it type of mentality with the conservatives that the problem is is that the bad part of conservatism is called complacency it means that you um, you don't see any reason to change anything you won't um, you don't see a need to address a problem until it hits you in the face and liberals are the good liberals are the ones who are concerned about necessary things that need to be fixed things that need to be there um, so that when the shit hits the fan people aren't disoriented that there is a plan in place that we can adapt to it quickly and um, because people jump on liberals um, this this is what happens is that you end up with um, you end up with um, problems like this there there are people that are talking about and, and you would hear things in the news and there are people that tend to be conservative will say well this is crazy this is crazy and the reason why is because they don't want to change um, they don't they won't educate themselves to to go out and see that certain things are needed um, one example of a problem with conservatives is the the idea um, the conservatives that are against climate change that that they don't believe in climate change that is not a good enough reason keep in mind that um, if we go and we do negotiations with other countries and they believe in climate change and we don't they are going to use that as a reason why not to negotiate with us okay and so that's that's the major problem with that kind of mentality when you it's it's it becomes political you know it can, becomes a world political problem and so your belief system um can't uh, i mean it has to pander it can't pan, you can't pander to what you want to do you have to think about the future because if you don't think about the future you will um suffer when when something comes about that's unpredictable and like this this was unpredictable and that's the reason why all the conservatives went crazy and why they thought their rights were being overdone and all this other stuff is because we didn't know how to approach this this thing we were not prepared and 
And so things that the liberals would have helped us with is to prepare us for such of an event, to permit, we cut corners, we didn't see any reason to have a lot of masks on hand. So for a whole month or two months, we didn't have anything on hand. And uh, of course, it really just affected New York. But um, I just I just think that um, people just, they don't, they watch their news media. They they don't understand that I'm. They they don't understand that there's always other points of view. They think that it's all either this or either you're for us or against us, uh, and it's either black or white, and that's a problem because it ain't either black or white. Um, it is not all conservatives. Some of this are progressive. Some of them are. I mean, some of them are in the middle. Sometimes it's not even a one-dimensional thing. Maybe it's two dimensionals, you know. Maybe it's multiple levels or other complex issues that people don't take into account because it's just a minor issue, a minority issue. Um, but, you know, we can't deal with complexity. Um, just the fact that we have two eyes and a nose and a mouth and, and ears, that that's a limited amount of senses. The reason why um, we have the that limitation of senses, why we don't have more senses, is to permit us to be human. Um, if we didn't, we'd be angels, okay? So for the religious community, if we were angels, we would know absolutely everything that's needed to know. We would have absolute perception. Um, Jesus had absolute perception. He could see things down the road you know he had faith but i think that to some degree he also saw things in the future he saw things down the road he knew all of the he could see into people's brains and things he had extra perceptive abilities we don't and so we should there should be less of an emphasis on our ability i mean that's the only way that somebody could just avoid sin is to have absolute perception and so because we have such a limited perception and that our brains conceptualize information um, that we don't know even when we hear something our brain is taking the culture into account and is interpreting that information based on the culture and if you come from a different culture you're going to hear something different than what another person because the words that you use here are not going to be the same words they use elsewhere and so your brain will conceptualize something different and then it'll get transferred to another person but it'll be skewed and people think that people lie no the fact is is that your brain is limited in its ability because you you have to understand more about the world in order to translate what people are saying so it makes it much harder to put information on a page because everybody's around the country and they're in different cultures and different um, when information is transferred to you they have to make sure that the words are a subset of all those cultures and if they're not a subset of all those cultures um, then somebody's going to get misinformation and then they're going to think it's lies and so there's lies there's there's misinformation um, there's misinterpretation misinter um, there's conceptualization in the brain that gets gets converted so there's um, translation um, and then on to, and then there is selective truth and so there's all these different things and people will look at the media and I'll say it lies but the thing is is you're getting information from a single resource and uh, you need to get from multiple resources because each one of those resources are going to take a different approach as to getting the information to you. Some are going to take a culture into account. Some are going to take a certain state or, you know, uh, they're going to take something into account to pass that information on. They won't get it to you correctly because your brain and your culture and all every, the people you're around is going to determine how you interpret that information. It's not going to get you one to one. We don't all in America speak the same language. The people in the South don't speak the same 
as people in the north. People in Boston don't speak the same as the rest of the country. People who are in South Carolina don't speak the same as everybody in the country. People that are, you know, in because of the way they talk, you can't understand them that way. Or if you don't understand their culture, if you talk to somebody from a different part of the world and you say, like, if you talk to somebody who's who's Spanish and you say, this is cool, and you translate it to them word for word, they wonder what is cold about it, you know. If they don't understand that cool means um, is slang for something that's cool, that's nice, you know. They don't hear nice, they hear cold. And so that's partially the reason that Google tries to look at your location and um, it needs to know your location because then it can know how to translate something according to people that are in your area. They might even um, look at all the words that you use in your communication so they have to understand what you're, what you're writing and based upon what you're writing they might be able to determine which culture you're in then they can determine what proper translation to give you based upon your culture. So if you're a Christian then you're probably going to see words differently than somebody who's non-Christian or somebody who's Jewish is going to see something different than people that are Christians or people that are Muslims are going to see things different than people. The combinations are going to create a different interpretation of, uh, of the information. So it isn't just by language, culture plays into it. So.